Hello, welcome to the Friday, June 5th, 2020 edition of the Science and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier did a quick write-up today about a new technique that he has seen by Malware to detect debuggers, and that's guard pages. Guard pages are memory pages that have the page guard flag set, and whenever these pages are accessed, then a status guard page violation exception is triggered. So this can be used to detect if or if not uh, there is a debugger present and the malware can then react respectively. So for more details, take a look at Xavier's diary. And then we got a couple of updates to our data feeds. First of all, I had to suspend our suspicious domain feed, which I know is quite popular. But the problem was that in recent months, some of the feeds that this uh, feed, which is really just an aggregate of uh, different other feeds, sort of relied on have really degraded and become less and less uh, useful. Peter from DNS Filter noticed this and notified us. So. I decided for now it's better to just suspend this feed. We are working on trying to resurrect it with different input feeds, but it may take a while to get it all set up. If you have any feedback or any sort of feeds you would like us to base it on, please let us know. And also I added more researcher IPs to our research feed that you can request via our API. About 150 different IP addresses that are part of IPIP.net have seen them scan quite a bit uh, in recent times. So you will now have these IP addresses included as well. Now, if you haven't heard of IPIP.net, it's probably because the company is based out of China. Now, they do have uh, somewhat global ambitions, but outside China, it's probably usually max mind what people are using for geolocation services. I remember how at one point there were proposals out there where spammers would essentially be allowed to send you email if they pay a nominal fee of a few cents. Well, it uh, looks like in Australia, actually, something like this is happening with bank transactions. Bank customers in Australia have reported receiving threatening and abusive messages that were included as a comment to transactions, to money transfers that they received to their account. Now, in these cases, it appears to be that in uh, most of the cases, where this happened that the sender was sort of familiar with the victim. So a lot of kind of domestic abuse uh, situations here where this is used and banks identified about 8,000 customers who received usually low level, less than a dollar deposits like this with abusive messages in the transaction description. The register is stating that you do have 18 characters available for these messages. You should have meant uh, to include something like a billing ID or a purchase order number or something like this. So not really a lot to play with, but I guess and that's again here a comment uh, from one of the CEOs of the banks involved here is that uh, these people go through quite some lengths uh, to actually get their threatening or harassing messages across. And Google released its usual monthly update for Android, uh, nothing sort of too out of the ordinary here. We have a total of four critical vulnerabilities, two of them in a system. And yes, they can lead to remote code execution. That's why they're labeled uh, critical, as well as two additional critical vulnerabilities in Qualcomm closed source components. Not a lot of detail at this point. Now, there's also sort of a little prank exploit uh, going around with a wallpaper for Android that will essentially crash Android if you're installing that particular wallpaper. This issue was made public late last week and I don't see it patched with this update. 
Now, exploitation is not very likely because it's not just sufficient to look at the image. So if someone sends it to you as a message or so, it's not going to do any damage. You actually have to install as a wallpaper. The sample image that I've seen is sort of actually a pretty nice looking a cloud mountain image, which, well, maybe somewhat tempting uh, to install that as a wallpaper. Well, it's uh, Friday again, and today I have with me Janusz here, uh, who wrote a SDI research paper about host-based intrusion detection in Unix. So could you introduce yourself, please? Hey, my name is Noosh. Um, that's my online handle. I am a cybersecurity engineer at MITRE Corporation. I'm currently working on my second year of the SANS STI program. I am really appreciating the class at work and the exams that are provided by this program. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions that you have about my paper. Yes, I really like your paper. And you know, being sort of a Unix Linux guy myself, can you tell us a little bit about what the paper was about and sort of what you found? Sure, sure. So my paper actually covered the three hardware intrusion detection systems, OSSEC, Samhain, and AutoD, at detecting many forms of attacks based on the MITRE attack framework. These include privilege escalation, persistence, and data exfiltration. Now, three different host-based intrusion detection systems. Personally, I've used OSSEC quite a bit. Uh, haven't really used Samhain much. Can you tell us a little bit how it differs from the others? OSSEC, as you know, is multi-platform and it's client-based and server-based. Uh, it has multiple feature sets like that. Samhain is a little bit of an older tool. It ended a development in 2005 and the website hasn't been updated as much. However, it offers the same functionality as OSSEC, except it has a little bit more of a active defense mechanism. As in, on top of the passive defense where it monitors the logs, monitors the system, it also has the feature set of enabling the defender to quarantine files, block ports, and do all those additional tasks. On top of that, it works very well with OS second audit D in conjunction if you use all three of them throughout your network. Yeah, that, that's sort of interesting. The active defense part, I've used it in OSEC. Actually, I had some problems with that just last week uh, where uh, OSEC uh, added an IP tables rule that uh, would then uh, block actually one of our reverse proxies you know, from connecting to the site and well, as a result, I took the site down. Any experiences with sort of the configurability of these tools? Actually, uh, I have had those issues as well. OSSEC was pretty straightforward in its installation process. A lot of the documentation for installations online, and since it's widely used, like you've used it in your network yourself, there's a lot of troubleshooting online and a lot of people working together to create the best rules possible and ask questions on how, how what they've created is blocking everything. Samhain on the other end is lacking a lot of its documentation. So a lot of the a lot of the issues that I had with generating the alerts and creating the rules for my research were, were upon the fact that there was no research into the rules that I was creating. So I had to rely heavily on doing the dash dash help that all these commands have and reading through the configuration files to make sure that what I'm doing makes sense and that it's going to work. Because if something failed, you had to delete everything and start from scratch. Right, yeah, that's, that's not very nice. Uh, and uh, what sort of hurt me also a little bit, uh, we're just recording this after the long weekend. And of course, it was a little bit difficult to get the person who actually set it up involved and trying to figure out sort of why OSEC uh, decided to block that particular IP address was also not really that uh, straightforward. Yeah, but at least the alerting was very straightforward. It told you exactly that's what it was true, blocking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it told me what it was blocking, and um, then, well, um, given that I didn't set up the system, so I had to reverse a lot of the things that happened there. Audit D actually came in helpful. I uh, was wondering, you know, what actually changed this one configuration file that added a block, and by enabling Audit D to watch this file, actually, that sort of led me into the path where I said, oh, it was OSEC that did it, kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, so actually, the, these different host-based intrusion detection systems, they can work nicely together, particularly like with Audit D sort of then feeding logs to OSEC, or how did you use it in your paper? Did you use them separate from each other, or did you sort of integrate them somewhat with each other? So actually, in my paper, I had three separate instances of a CentOS image installed. So I start, had, started from scratch and had three separate ones. And on each of them, I had, well, on one of them, I had OSSEC. On the other one, I had Samhain. And on the other one, I had Audit D. So they, they weren't working in conjunction. They were working separately. And I was showing their capabilities at detecting those adversarial tactics 
just by solely having those systems installed. However, I am advocating for having all of them work in conjunction. And actually, my paper focuses heavily on how one of, how, how they all have pros and cons, but in conjunction, those cons are minimalized. Therefore, in conjunction, they work extremely well at detecting adversaries. And like you said, they ought to de- helped you to locate where yeah. OSSEC was making these was where OSX configuration files modified to catch wh- wh- where your bug was. So they work well in that sense as well. Yeah, and uh, these days I usually recommend RDD because it's sort of the default one. And it's integrated with uh, Linux. Now, OSX, uh, you usually do get a standard package for it, but it's it sort of has more an add-on feeling than RDD. It's sort of less baked into the, the operating system. Any sort of blind spots that you saw with Audit D where some of the others really sort of filled in the gaps or did it cover what you needed? Actually, I really enjoyed Audit D's features because it relied more on the system calls, system calls side of everything. For example, in one of my programs that I wrote it involved creating a user and changing the password of the user. And so therefore, OSSEC and Samhain both detected that when new user appeared in the Etsy passwords and Etsy shadow file, but they weren't able to tell me what the exact binary was that or with what the exact script and location of the script was. Audit D, on the other hand, told me that the user add command was executed, told me that the ch password command was executed, and it told me every single step of my script that was executed, as well as the location of that script. So it was very helpful in determining that. So these, uh, does this call uh, driven nature from Audit D, does that also work uh, if the malware doesn't even touch files, sort of if it's just running in memory? It does, because even if it's running in memory, it's still using syscalls. Yeah, so that's I guess, okay. confirms my current opinion that uh, Audit D is sort of the way to go if you get started with that. What about sort of the attack or the log overload? That's sort of always one problem with these host-based intrusion detection systems. If your systems aren't well-defined, if you don't have real sort of solid uh, change management, you easily get sort of flooded with alerts, events uh, from these uh Post-based intrusion detection systems, and in the end, uh, you you ignore them. Um, any tips here how to avoid that? From my research, I found that many times each of these alerts or each of these hits, host-based intrusion detection systems, not only generated the alert but also had a little description or a type or a message that would notify the administrators what the actual modification or what the actual change was. And I think that feeding all of these logs to some kind of elk solution or some kind of logs storage solution, and then parsing the logs for the messages you need, for example, add user. Tell me every single time a user was added. That's something that I'm only looking for, and I really don't care about this other stuff. So it all depends on what network you're looking for and how you store your logs and how you decide to parse them. So really tuning post-processing of the logs, all of this, just like with any kind of alerting system, really makes it work then in the end. That is correct. Okay, well then, uh, thanks for joining me, and uh, I'll add a link uh, to the paper in the show notes. Thanks. Thank you. And well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening, and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.